I would like to thank the honored guests that came from Russia and Israel to commemorate 20 years of re relations between our, our two countries and the memory of the late Ambassador Alexander Bovin. Events like this demonstrate the great importance that both our countries pay to the strong and close relations. I have the honor to chair today the panel that focused on significant and important aspects of our very, very close re uh, relations, joint security and economic challenges in the 21st, 21st century. In the last years, we witnessed a few important developments in a vivid of friends. One of them is the cancellation of the need for visas, and we know how right, the um, uh, growth, uh, the transport of tourists. As well, business. Business is the, uh, this what contribute to the mutual economic relations. There is a notable growth in the economic relations, but there is still a lot to do, and I hope that events like this will continue to contribute to the um, mutual of our the strandings. Another important subject in the security challenges uh, in the 21st century. Unfortunately, in this event that our both countries uh, facing and have to handle challenges that try to interview with the um, security and, uh, sorry, stability of our um, regions. With no further ado, I would like to present the first speaker, Vice Pri uh, Prime Minister and Minister of Strategic uh, Affairs, Mr. Moshe Ayalon. Thank you, Ms. Ambassador. Good afternoon, honor guests here on the stage, in the hall, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and honor to speak here and to pay respect to late Ambassador Alexander Bovin. The seed that he has sowed 20 years ago grew and flourished and the impressive cooperation between Israel and Russia demonstrates it. Israel has benefited a lot from these relations. About one million new immigrants made Aliyah and gave a significant boost to the state of Israel. They have been integrated in the Israeli society and have contributed a great deal in all aspects of life like science, industry, medicine, culture, arts, and security. Talking about the security perspective, which we are going to discuss here today, I think that Erdin Stekir, one of the Turkish IHH activists, is a person who probably represents in the best way the common security threats that Israel and the Russian Federation are facing. It was only after he was released from an Israeli hospital where he was treated after he was lightly injured on board of the Mavi Marmara that we learned that he was one of the radical Muslim activists who hijacked the Russian ferry Abrasia back in 1996, demanding the release of Chechen terrorists. The lesson we have to learn from this incident is that radical Islam is a threat to all of us. This radical movement has no interest in stability. They want to change the world order and to make Islam the prominent element in the new order, their Islam. Stability means, in their opinion, eternalizing the existing, the existing world order. 
The radical Islamic camp is made today of two main groups. The first, led by Iran and its affiliates, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and fully supported by Syria, focuses as a first stage on weakening Israel, but has clear regional and global aspirations for hegemony. The other group, led by Al-Qaeda and its many affiliates in Muslim and non-Muslim countries around the world, focuses its activity against infidels all around the world with emphasis on international presence in the Middle East and moderate Islamic regimes. Radical Islam doesn't have the capability to launch a conventional war as a means for achieving its political goals. Therefore, it operates in three alternative ways of action. The most visible way of action is terror. By indiscriminately hitting civilians in Israel, in Russia, in the US, in moderate Arab states and elsewhere, the terrorists believe that they can make their story heard so fear, anxiety, and helplessness among their enemy ranks and force their opponents to concede more political ground to them. They make good use of the difficulties and deficiencies that security organizations face in fighting terrorism in order to have successes from time to time. And even if they fail in carrying out a terror attack, they benefit from the publicity they get. Iran is playing a major role in promoting this terror campaign, and it supports terrorists all over the Middle East. I have been the chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF. When we managed to force the Palestinians to abandon suicide bombings in particular and terrorism in general as the main tool for promoting their goal. We were able to make this happen through a combination of national resilience, political will, creative intelligence, and out-of-the-box operational ideas. In recent years, we succeeded in deterring the main terror groups from using their capabilities especially improved rockets against us by making it clear to them that the price they may have to pay is too high. But there was another important element that enabled us to have an effective counter-terrorism strategy, and that is international cooperation. Our exchange of information, technologies, and lessons learned with our partners including the Russian Federation, was very beneficial to us and to our friends and partners as well. The second way of action of the terrorists is attempt of the radicals to acquire state-of-the-art weaponry, including weapons of mass destruction. The most dangerous effort in this respect is radical Iranian regime determination to develop a nuclear weapon. If they manage to succeed, the regional and international stability will be threatened in an unacceptable manner. Iran defies the international community by continuing its nuclear activities and it has to be stopped. We highly appreciate the Russian commitment to this policy as manifested by the Russian support of Security Council Resolution 1929 and by the cancellation of the S-300 deal. But this might not be enough. The Iranian regime must get a very clear message from the international community that it must give up the idea of having a capability to produce nuclear weapons and that the international powers will use all their capabilities to prevent it and will not wink or seek compromise. In the meanwhile, we are concerned with the arms acquisition of Syria, a declared member of the radical camp who was trying to have its own clandestine nuclear weapon program. 
Syria receives vast amounts of weaponry from Iran and unfortunately from Russia as well, while it supports Hezbollah with highly advanced weapons, both those produced in Syria based on Russian assistance like the heavy rockets that hit Israel in 2006 and those coming from Russia as a complete product like the Cornet anti-tank missile without any repercussions. Al-Qaeda too is probably seeking weapons of mass destruction and if it manages to acquire them, the worst nightmare of our lifetime may come true. We have to make sure that this is not going to happen and cooperate with each other in preventing this eventuality. The third way of action used by radical elements is trying to weaken those who fight terrorism through delegitimizing them. This effort focuses against Israel, but Russia too is one of the victims of this campaign. We should stand together in facing this threat. The Palestinians believe that this delegitimization campaign will enable them to establish a state along the 67 lines without providing necessary security arrangements and without recognizing Israel's right to exist behind secured and recognized boundaries as a free and democratic nation state of the Jewish people with equal civilian rights to all its citizens. Russia was the first country to recognize Israel in 1948. And at that time, it was clear that Israel is a Jewish state mentioned in Resolution 181 of the General Assembly. Russia can lead now an international message to the Palestinians that they have to recognize the right of the Jewish people to have their nation state in the land of their ancestors because only when this happens, a real lasting and stable peace may emerge. Israel is committed to promoting peace, but the lack of such a Palestinian recognition and the ongoing hate indoctrination by the Palestinians are the main reasons why the peace process has failed again and again in the last 17 years since the Oslo Agreement. Radical Islam, terror and non-state parties who challenge the world order are the main threats to our countries. 25 years ago, it was beyond imagination to think about cooperation between Russia as part of the Soviet Union at that time and the State of Israel. The diplomatic relations today between Russia and Israel have brought about benefits to our countries as well as to the entire world. We have to enhance the cooperation in order to meet our present and future, future challenges. We are able and we are ready to make it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to invite the chairman of the Council for Foreign and Defense Policy and chairman of the additional board of Russian in Global Affairs magazine, Sergei Karaganov. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here today with us. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellencies, dear friends. It's a great honor and uh, privilege indeed uh, to be here, uh, to see many friendly faces, uh, to see some friends and even relatives uh, here and outside this room. Uh, I came here for three reasons. One is to show respect to the perseverance and courage of the Israelis who for uh, uh, for already 60 years have uh, fought against all odds and have survived and probably I agree with the head of uh, uh, Mossad will continue to survive well. Uh, second, of course, to uh, uh, to show my admiration to Alexander Blobin, uh, whom I knew, whom I admired, whom I envied as a young person trying to be as 
good as him, uh, which is impossible. Um, uh, and uh, who was one of the co regions and uh, um, uh, unorthodox and free uh, thinkers in my uh, unfree country. Now, I also came here to pay a tribute to a friend of Alexander Bovin, a late academician Arbatov, who I consider my, uh, my mm, teacher, who together with Bovin and a group of other people have been, uh, uh, with, have been fighting for years against the stupidity of non-recognition of Israel, against and for uh, the freedom of movement of uh, all, all, all Soviets, but starting with the uh, Jewish Soviets. And uh, it was a very hard struggle, and um, I would say it needed a lot of courage, but I knew that it, they have been doing that together in groups, and in the end they helped first our Jewish citizens to get uh, freedom of movement, by, and by that they freed um, uh, Russia itself to a large extent, because it gave a window of opportunity to all of us. Um, when pre preparing for this seminar, I have looked through all the scenarios of possible settlement that, of course, uh, I wouldn't um, uh, dare uh, to give you any advice. I mean, you, uh, you have all these advice. Uh, uh, instead of that, uh, what could I possibly do? I will give you a picture um, of the world as I see it in a most unorthodox way, uh, just in respect. Uh, uh, to Alexander Bovin, who was a uh, most uh, unorthodox th thinker. Now first, what is um, happening? The world is changing so rapidly that uh, the old recipes, or even the yesterday's recipes, are getting obsolete before they get into print. I mean, we could not understand what is happening. Uh, and if, we pre the, if somebody is pretending to understand what is happening, uh, that means that he is a liar. Um, uh, I pretend to, uh, I, as, a, as a professional I think an analyst, I must say that knowledge uh, uh, is uh, now, uh, is, is, um, is almost, in many cases, worthless. Intuition sometimes helps, but intuition only if you understand the very, few, the very simple thing that probably you're wrong again. Uh, but uh, still, I will um, uh, give a small picture of things what, uh, are around Russia and Israel which could influence us together. First, the intellectual vacuum, which I have already mentioned. Uh, uh, the old paradigms which have been governing us, uh, the old Western paradigms, I'm not anti-Western, but the most of the intellectual paradigms which have been governing our thinking were born in the West are obviously either wrong or obsolete, or even if they are still true, we do not know whether they are true or not. Uh, second, uh, the world is moving away uh, from uh, international governance uh, towards traditional chaotic state of world affairs. The economic globalization and uh, um, uh, globalization in terms of climate, water, etc., etc., continues. Uh, but so the new challenges call for global management, uh, but the world governance turns back uh, to nation state, at best to regional governors. That is the biggest contradiction and schism uh, we are facing. I mean, the world calls for globalization, the governance goes national, uh, which, by the way, is not bad for Israel. Which and for Russia, which are by definition are nation states and um, and act as nation states uh, in international affairs. Um, uh, the European integration project, uh, the great achievement of humanity, is proving to be an exemption rather than the wave of the future. Uh, uh, the power of transnational corporations, which 10, 20 years ago were thought to be the wave of the future uh, is waning. Where are these transnational corporations? They are, of course, producing a lot of goods. And they are, of course, moving, um, uh, uh, they're helping us to, uh, to prosper. And they're help, helping technological development. But their political power uh, is gone. Uh, and uh, uh, and, that were, and uh, they're putting, uh, even at, uh, 10 years ago, it was believed that the world would believe 
uh, would belong to the power of the transnationals, uh, the power of NGOs. And I'm ahead of the only uh, surviving independent NGO, and not all this NGO in Russia. The power, uh, the power of the NGOs is dwindling, too. Uh, uh, or of, of course, they're not they're not, they're not waning away, uh, but clearly they're not uh, as powerful as uh, uh, we thought they would be only a few years ago. Uh, uh, to the fact that NGOs are powerful now, they are the arms of the governments, one or another. There is there, of course, a, a few NGOs which have been mentioned by Prime Minister, like uh, the International Terrorist Network. But this is one of the few. Uh, which survives independently or largely independently or semi-independently from governments. And uh, by the way, they are relatively effectively fought by the governments, though of course they are not exactly a waning threat. Uh, because of the overpopulation uh, of the new uh, industrial revolution, of the growing demand for food and, and minerals, territory is growing in importance again. And not only for the tiny Israel, but worldwide. We are witnessing the start for the new uh, competition for territory. Uh, it is only in the making, but let me remind you, just to give me an example from an absolutely different uh, point of view. I mean, probably Israelis wouldn't even think about it. You know, of course, you have heard probably that there is a growing even military political competition for the resources of the Arctic. Uh, let me remind you that allegedly 25% uh, of undiscovered sick, undiscovered resources of uh, energy resources of the Arctic are um, uh, within the territorial, alleged territorial waters of uh, Russia. That is, a that is a description of a fantastic farcical game. That is, that is, that, is uh, that, that reminds you of, of this new. Uh, importance of territory. There are no resources there, most probably, or they are non-recoverable, but we are already fighting for them. And that will continue. And so probably, again, uh, the fact that uh, 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 Israel is fighting for its territory will be appreciated a bit more than previously. Um, uh, the United States, after uh, the uh, three misses, uh, the Iraqi one, the Afghani one, and due to the um, you know, world economic crisis, uh, has lost their predominance and will continue to lose uh, its predominance in the world, uh, like it or not, uh, because uh, any analyst, and here I would uh, probably uh, try to be as precise as I could, though I have said that, of course, any prediction in this world is, is worthless. Uh, it will start to do. It will continue to lose its military predominance, if only not, if only for uh, budgetary and fiscal reasons. Uh, so the world will be uh, multi will be growing multipolar, even in military uh, terms. Uh, 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 coupled with the unprecedented uh, shift of economic powers, uh, uh, unstoppable uh, for the time being. Uh, one could uh, call the situation even a pre-war, a pre-world war, but for one, but I wouldn't uh, uh, call it that. For one stabilizing and civilizing factor, with st the still massive presence of uh, nuclear weapons, the weapons of Armag Armageddon. They are dangerous, uh, but they have uh, saved the humanity from World War uh, three during the Cold War, which was the worst standoff in the history of humanity, both ideological and geopolitical. But we didn't go for war. And we wouldn't go for war now because of the fact that the nuclear arms, uh, massive nuclear uh, arsenals of Russia and the, the United States are there. The attempts to decrease the role of nuclear weapons um, uh, or going to, by going to zero or worse, uh, to the minimal deterrence, have probably failed. Uh, the U.S. will uh, have to rely more on uh, nuclear weapons. That is the policy, uh, which uh, the real policy, uh, which uh, contradicts, I mean, the statements of the policy. My country, Russia, for obvious reasons, will have to rely on nuclear weapons too. There will be attempts to um, renew the process of nuclear disarmament uh, by freeing Europe from uh, the residual Russian, uh, U.S. and Russian 
uh, tactical nukes by involving uh, uh, third countries or by freeing a Middle East from Israeli and future Iranian bombs, but I'm afraid uh, this will be also a futile att attempt. Uh, the genie of proliferation is out of the bottle. Israel, uh, India, Pakistan, North Korea got nuclear and got more influence and recognition. Uh, the international uh, bygone era ineffective attempts uh, to persuade Iran not to go nuclear will probably fail, and I say that with great res uh, regret, I, and I hope that I am wrong. Uh, the question is whether it will announce that it has the bomb, whether it hide it in the cellar, or will it stop on the threshold uh, capacity um, uh, level. Uh, of course, uh, one, could, one could try, Israel could try to uh, postpone the almost inevitable uh, by a strike, but the cost uh, is prohibitive. But it's for you, of course, to decide. It's not my uh, task here uh, to advise Israelis on what they should or not should do. Uh, so uh, the, probably the new reality is descending. The reality of a multiple, uh, multi, uh, multiple uh, nuclear Middle East. Uh, what? Um, uh, so I could continue with enumerating the breathtaking as, uh, br uh, with enumerating the breathtaking changes in the strategic environment, uh, but uh, for two minutes I will go. I will talk to, I'll go to the mundane uh, field of economics. Uh, Russia is not modernizing itself. Uh, nobody wants modernization. Um, uh, nobody is ready for modernization. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, argument between political uh, between those who want political modernization and who want technical modernization is simply futile and off for the mark. Uh, the real issue is the modernization of our uh, thinking, and it will take time. Uh, just to modernize our thinking, we have to uh, return to our culture, with, uh, and this is your culture too. Uh, and uh, also uh, to deal with the sin uh, we have committed as a nation, uh, where uh, the sin uh, of, um, uh, of wasting away millions of our citizens during uh, the civil war, which uh, has been happening in my country uh, for almost 70 years. But it's all our problem. Israel is, of course, uh, much more technically advanced, uh, but is also uh, We'll also probably losing its um, uh, leading position uh, uh, um, uh, for the very simple reason. Uh, China and other countries are producing 100 times more engineers than the old world. And uh, t even technological uh, leadership is moving in, in that direction, not only industrial leadership. Nobody uh, wants to recognize the fact that 22% of the world uh, export of um, uh, high-tech products are now Chinese-born. 6.9 are Singaporean-born. Uh, Europe uh, is only two-thirds of the Chinese experts, and the United States is only half. Of course, most of the Chinese experts, uh, high-tech ex experts, are generated from uh, American technologies and even from Israeli technologies, but they are are uh, doing their technologies themselves. So, I mean, we are in for a, uh, for a struggle, um, uh, for a losing battle, uh, if we do not unite our forces. And I'm speaking we, not, not Israelis and Russians, but we Europeans, uh, for the very simple reason, because the situation in Europe is uh, um, much worse. They are under-invest uh, uh, in, uh, they under-invest in uh, uh, science and technology, and they are growing and lagging behind. By the way, Russia could survive under these circumstances better than others for the very simple reason, because there is a huge growing market for food, uh, for energy, and for minerals. But uh, that would mean that Russia would become uh, the subsidiary uh, uh, the uh, energy, uh, agricultural, and uh, mineral resources subsidiary of Greater China. I'm not quite, I'm quite fascinated by this prospect. Uh, I'd rather try. I'd rather try to join forces with the uh, with the like-minded uh, countries and or with the culturally close countries. 
uh, not against China. China is a great civilization which is returning back to the humanity, to the humanity which has been uh, um, uh, suppressed for 150 years. Uh, but for um, uh, for uh, using uh, for for uh, for making the world more stable, Israel, Russia, Turkey, and Europe has to play a unified role as a third pole in the future world, in spite of the fact that, of course, if Israel is irritated at, at Europe, or, um, uh, Europe is growing at Israeli, and, uh, but although Russia, thanks God, although a part of Europe is neither uh, irritated by Israel or not anti-Israeli, we could play uh, uh, a role of a link. Uh, so uh, what could be uh, done uh, in secure terms. Uh, first, uh, it's understood we are in a blind alley in the larger Middle East, uh, and there is no solution uh, in the vicinity. So the, when there is no solution, you want to have to recognize that and go beyond or around it. One way is to uh, persuade Russia and the United States uh, to get into in the real term, in real terms. Uh, there is not only uh, is an Israeli-Palestinian problem here. The worst problem in the larger Middle East is there's a growing security vacuum around the Persian Gulf, where everybody, everybody hates, dislikes, uh, or fears each other. And that uh, problem, uh, long term, in in in, lo in, in terms in long term, could provide even more problems than Israeli-Palestinian one. One has has to start to think about the comprehensive settlement of the Middle Eastern problem, not only as an Arab-Israeli problem. And there, Russia and the United States have to come with security guarantees and to support uh, a kind of a new uh, security system. It is a long way, but without a start where we will be in a uh, deteriorating uh, situation for quite some time. Uh, second, uh, 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 the cooperation uh, on BMD should continue, and I'm happy that Russia is, uh, uh, even in terms of or even in terms of lip service, uh, is joining uh, the effort of the United States to build some kind of a BMD system. Uh, but we must understand that BMD system is not a panacea. Uh, it could prevent some saber rattling of Iran if, if it acquires nuclear weapons, or it could prevent an authorized use, but it wouldn't solve the problem. The, the problem could be solved only by cooperative deterrence. And that's why I believe it is high time that intellectuals, at least on the intellectuals and policy thinkers, on uh, be, uh, American, Israel, Russian, others, should start to seriously talk about the nuclear situation in the larger Middle East. Of course, I know how hard it is for the United States, for Israel, who has been hiding its nuclear potential for so long. Uh, but uh, uh, but it, is, it, it, it is time to start to think about seriously, because probably cooperative deterrence could work. It has worked. Um, in Europe, why not here? Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, understanding that the world is moving so fast, I don't think uh, that Israel should panic uh, or change its course. It's not that I'm supporting Israel against Arabs, no, at all. I mean, I'm, I'm a Russian. Uh, but uh, one thing which the world is, uh, uh, has proven uh, has proven is that uh, the luck changes. My country was extremely unlucky for most of uh, its history. But during the last uh, 17 years, foreign policy-wise, the wind has been blowing in our sails. We are Russia, I mean. Uh, we are a third-rate economic power, maybe a second-rate, if I'm kind, but we are first-rate strategic power, the third in the world, uh, the third in the world, world, for the very obvious reasons, because of uh, luck. Because Europe is weakening, the United States has got us all problems, because we are sitting on the larger Middle East, which could not, uh, whose problems could not be solved with our, without our problems. So luck could change even. Uh, for Israel, if of course it doesn't make strategic 
uh, mistakes. And lastly, and above all, we have uh, to learn a lesson from Alexander Bovin, who was uh, able to go beyond established truths and ch challenge them, and to go beyond orthodoxy. Uh, uh, he's not uh, with us anymore, but if we remember his uh, free willing thinking and his free willing manners, it, uh, he will be with, with us, helping us to, to do with the world as it is. Thank you. Uh, there was very interesting points in your speech, and thank you very, very much. Now I would like um, to invite the Director of Policy and Political and Military Affairs at the Israel Military of Defense, Major General uh, Resist Amos Gilad, please. Good afternoon. It's very moving to speak here. We have the uh, previous uh, director of, of intelligence uh, who remembers who could imagine that we would stand here and speak about our relations with, with Russia. And I would like to touch the most sensitive area in the whole, all areas. This is the security. Uh, two months ago, uh, Minister of Defense of Russia, Mr. Serdyukov, with uh, the Deputy General Popovkin and all the staff and our Minister of Defense on behalf of State of Israel have signed agreement, upgraded agreement uh, about cooperation, security and military cooperation. In Russia, in Russian language, it's called military cooperation. We talk about security the same. And uh, it was signed in the Ministry of Defense in Moscow after uh, official ceremony. And our minister, as a symbol, was uh, welcomed in the most official and friendly way. And this agreement speaks about strategic dialogue and other areas that I don't want to elaborate here, but it's very moving. It was very moving to sit in, in the official hall in, the, in Moscow and to, to attend the, the signing of this ceremony of signing this agreement. That's one good news. I would like to share with you some balance of our relations after 20 years. Of course, I begin with the good news. The good news, of course, this is this this agreement. The second issue, Russia and Israel are cooperating in joint venture um, in very important countries about security projects. It's based on common knowledge of Russia and Israel for the benefit of the export, that in Israel security export is very important because it finances or supports our uh, operational and uh, security readiness for the future um, scenarios that may happen in the Middle East. In Russia, the, sec the security export is very <coughs> developing, let's say, billions of dollars. It's considered as very important. So Israel and uh, Russia have decided uh, to upgrade uh, cooperation about joint venture abroad. And we have projects in India and other countries, and they are very successful, and the horizon looks quite rosy. About Iran, it was mentioned. For us, Iran is strategic, and even more than that, threat. But Iran is also a strategic threat to the whole Middle East. We are sharing with Russia, as one of the most important superpowers, about our concerns about Iran. First, it was very difficult. I must. I must share with you, because Iran didn't, uh, Russia didn't accept our perception that Iran with nuclear weapon, and Iran is determined to reach nuclear weapon. We don't have any doubt about that. We were the first in the world, I think, to, um, to share this concern. And after the Iraq issue, uh, it's needed to have the intelligence to support it. Our intelligence picture is very clear since, I think, 15 years, and it shows very clearly that Iran is determined to reach the nuclear. Iran is determined to support, and they are successful in a way, the new phenomena of radical axis. We do have new entities at the expense of legitimate states. In the north, we have Hezbollah, support, it's like cancer. 
eating Lebanon. Lebanon, you know, in the world there are states with constitution, states without constitution, and constitution without state. This is Lebanon, unfortunately. At the expense of Lebanon, emerging Hezbollah with 45,000 rockets now, supported and heavily and massively by Iran. The same phenomena with Sunnis in Gaza. We call it Hamastan. And Hamastan are supported heavily and massively by Iran. They don't like each other, but they need each other. So Hamastan is the expense of the Palestinian Authority. Even if we sign agreement tomorrow, tomorrow morning, it cannot be implemented as long as half of the Palestinian territory that considered by Abu Mazen as Palestine is under control of Hamas, that their desire is to take over uh, take over Abu Mazen and to change the West Bank and Abu Mazen's uh, West Bank area to become another Hamastan. And Hamas, that's what we are sharing very um, intimately with, with Russia, and it was mentioned by uh, General Yalon, we have found leaflets of Hamas supporting the Chechen and other kinds of terror in, in, uh, in Russia. And Hamas, even in Arabic, and uh, in Russia you have many experts that speak Arabic, I'm sure some of them here, Haraka Mukama Islamia, it means Muslim. There is no even word Palestinian. They belong to the Muslim brothers that want to change the whole Middle East, and Muslim brothers, you can find them in Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Here I come to the point. We have reached very intimate uh, discussions with our friends in Russia. In the intelligence, of course, it's not, it's not possible to elaborate, but also on strategic levels, including the Ministry of Defense. And we are sharing our concerns. And our concerns that Hamas is a terror organization. I remember, I, I'm, I'm sure it will be denied by the Russians, but I remember the tolerance that was shown to us before and during the operation in Gaza because there is understanding what does it mean Hamas, professionally, I'm not talking about politics. We are sharing with Russia for a long time our concerns about Iran. The decision of Russia to cancel, I think this is the first time since decades, cancel after a decision to review the whole relation between Russia or to suspend the, the supply of S-200 is more dramatic than it looks. This is dramatic signal to the Iranians. Yes, Russia understands the danger of Iran to the whole stability of the Middle East. It's not only Israel. For Israel, it's understood. Can you imagine nuclear Iran, what the Saudis will do, what the Egyptians will do? The whole Middle East will change. And the decision that was declared in Washington, not in Moscow even, by Mr. Serdyukov, is very significant. Our interpretation, I'm not sure it's reliable, I'm not representing Russia, that it happened after the, the speech of Mr. Obama that has exposed the secret site of COM, namely secret site for developing enriched uranium for, for nuclear weapon. It was kind of shock. And we have got some signs that there was a shock also in, in in Russia that for some years didn't believe that Iran would become such a threat. It seems to us that even the vote in the Security Council that was mentioned previously, it's another sign. It's another sign of the recognition of, uh, of Russia in this threat. And it will become worse and worse uh, if it's not stopped. And it must be stopped. And to deal with it efficiently, we consider Russia as like superpower and to deal with it efficiently on diplomatic, on other, other areas, we need the support of Russia. And that's why the Constitutional of Security Council is so important. And to deprive Iran for capabilities that can enhance its, its, uh, its desire to, uh, to acquire a, a nuclear weapon. So this is very good news. And it's very good news because it does not become as a s automatic or direct support in Israel. It comes from deep understanding of Russia. And we are very proud that we have shared our concerns for a long time. And this dialogue is developing about terror. It's very, I mean, it's very moving 
that uh, since the landing of the Russian uh, plane here in the southern part of Israel, it was some kind of, uh, you know, juncture. Since then, our cooperation, knowledge, intelligence about terror is very impressive. Why? Because it's global. The, the first minutes of the visit, the official visit of our minister in the uh, Minister of Defense in Russia, there was an act of terror in Dagestan. I'm not sure that so many in Israel know exactly where Dagestan is, but the terror is very clear. And it was mentioned during dialogue with Mr. Putin, Prime Minister Putin, in his, in his residence uh, in Sochi. Again, it's very, I couldn't imagine, I dealt with assessments. I couldn't assess that we would meet with Mr. Putin and discussing with him terror in his dacha in Sochi, in, about Dagestan. And Mr. Putin was so angry, so furious about the terror. And we shared with him very easily our desire, as it was mentioned, to continue and to upgrade our cooperation. And we are ready to any kind of cooperation with Russia about terror, beginning with intelligence and ending with technology. And, um, and we have discussed it also with heads of, the, of generals like General Karabelnikov and other generals that are dealing with HLS. And we are widening the cooperation in the most impressive way based on mutual interest or global interest. And you cannot hide the fact. You can hide it. But uh, Hamas shares sympathy with the Islamic so-called terror in, uh, in Russia. So we are in the same boat, whether we like it or not. Any time I meet with our, our friends in Russia, I feel that we are in the same boat, whether we deny it or approve it. About strategic cooperation in our areas, other areas, we have, uh, we are trying to develop mutual uh, uh, relations also that will deal with some knowledge we have about reorganiza reorganization in, in Russia. There is dramatic process of reorganization of the, of the Russian army. And uh, uh, we were asked even to contribute some advisors. We have a lot of experience. And uh, another development is a decision of Russia and Israel um, to build, Russia will establish UAV factory in the center of Moscow. Not in the center, but in the suburb of Moscow. It's a, and it was declared openly. A way, for me, it's uh, unperceivable. I cannot perceive it sometime. This UAV, the searchers, uh, will be, uh, this is a bargain between uh, our II and, uh, and the Russian industry, and it's very encouraging for the future. However, I'm talking about balance, there are shadows, and I would like to share with you. Syria, on one hand, declares they want peace. That uh, maybe there will be peace or not, but they are so violent in their attitudes towards the confrontation. They are supporting Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Revolutionary Guards, Iran. And there is supply of weapons to Hezbollah. It was mentioned Cornet. Cornet is the best uh, anti-tank missile, 1.2 kilometers of range, very effective one, was supplied to Hezbollah. Hezbollah is their organization. Look what's going on in Lebanon. Maybe they will be put on trial and Hezbollah will destroy the court in order to avoid the... Uh, avoid the trial. We are dealing with very violent and cruel organization. It was supplied. We have supplied our, our colleagues in Russia with documents from the factory to Lebanon. We didn't say that Russia is supporting them. Of course, they are not supporting terror. Russia is against terror. I could feel it when I heard Mr. Putin talking about terror with such anger. But we are living in a very tough neighborhood. Cornet is against Israel, and we are talking about now Yahont. This is very modern and lethal weapon. This is a supersonic cruise missile for 300 kilometers. In Russia, 300 kilometers is like moving between one suburb to another suburb. In our area, 300 kilometers, they can threaten all ports in Israel. But this is not only against ships. This weapon is against ground targets. And this is very dangerous. We have many reasons to believe that this Yahont 
will be supplied from Syria to Hezbollah. Because Hezbollah, Syria today, is not hesitating to supply all kinds of weapons to Hezbollah. It was published about SCADI. SCADI uh, is a strategic weapon in Syria, and it was supplied according to all pieces of information that we have to Hezbollah. Not important the details now, but the, 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 can you imagine that Syria, during the Hafez Asa times, the fathers, that he was very cruel, but very smart and very calculated, very balanced, he didn't supply weapons to terrorists. This Yachon uh, can cause us casualties, and we are very much concerned, and we take it very seriously. And we urged our friends in Russia to avoid the supply of the Yachon to Syria, and it was denied. And I won't be surprised that they will supply them another modern, other modern uh, weapons. The decision in, in, uh, in Russia, it seems to us, that is to enhance the re military relations with Syria for non reason, traditional reason, historic reasons. But please, based on our developing relations, it's very important to pay attention to our warnings. Like Iran here in Syria, Syria is uh, under Bashar Assad that according to all, uh, all information, he tried to even to develop strategic weapon. He's not hesitating to support terror organizations, and especially at, at the top of them is Hezbollah. So these shadows must be removed, and we expect uh, from Russia uh, to avoid uh, supplying uh, Syria uh, dangerous weapons that sooner or later based on the on, this, on the intentions of Hezbollah, Hezbollah star, as I mentioned, has today maybe or at least 45,000 rockets, and their ambitions are very clear. It's very important that Russia, uh, as ally or partner or superpower with responsibility, will try to avoid selling uh, weapons that can contribute to, uh, to, to shake to this, uh, or to threaten the stability uh, in, in the Middle East. About the Palestinians, um, uh, of course, we have a, a dialogue with, uh, with, with Russia. We are trying to enlighten our security interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Hamas, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Palestinian Authority. For example, if, even if there is peace, to abandon immediately or uh, to leave uh, the West Bank and to, expose, to be exposed to threats like from Gaza and from Lebanon, it's unacceptable. Today in Israel, we are not suffering from either uh, ballistic or rockets or mortars even or suicide. It took us long years to defeat this kind of terror. And in the center of Israel, we cannot tolerate it. I'm not to go to details, but we are sharing these concerns uh, uh, with our friends in, in Russia. Uh, to sum up, um, there is much better atmosphere, very friendly atmosphere in our discussions in all, on all levels. We are discussing everything. Uh, the decision, uh, decisions about Iran, very encouraging. Uh, our joint ventures are very important. On the other hand, the shadows may become real threat to us and we urge our friends to take it into consideration and simply to avoid it. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. It was very, very impressive and interesting. Um, head of the National Economic Council, Israel Prime Minister's Office, Department of Economics, Hebrew University, Professor Eugene Kandel. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm a relative newcomer to the public service, and uh, I don't much get to see all these uh, security and foreign relations conference, but if you ask me, I'm started looking for the nearest nuclear shelter after these three gentlemen. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably not going to attend any more of these. It's too scary. 
Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation, nevertheless, and you know, at least this was an interesting experience. Um, I never had the chance to, uh, to meet uh, Mr. Bovin, but from all accounts, he was a very col colorful person and did a lot for furthering uh, Israeli-Russian relations, and so it was uh, probably my loss. And this conference is a good tribute to his memory. Uh, just a quick disclosure, uh, I'm, uh, um, I'm a transplant. I was born in Moscow and uh, 33 years ago came to this country. So I'm sort of uh, was in, in both worlds. Uh, and uh, as many other uh, Russian-speaking Israelis, I made my home here and, uh, you know, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm Israeli, but uh, nevertheless, this year, when I was accompanying Prime Minister to Moscow to the state visit, it was a very powerful experience for me. But the ambassador here was there and welcomed us, and um, it was it was very 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 moving experience for me, uh, and um, it was not something that I've uh, I've thought about when I was growing up in in, in Moscow. Anyway, uh, I was asked to talk about economics. Uh, well. I'm not going to say anything scary or anything uh, unusual. Actually, I'm going to probably be very brief. Uh, it's very hard to, well, it's, you can imagine, but uh, there are not many countries that are so different in terms of their economies as, uh, as Israel and Russia. You know, if you think about size, both in terms of population and, and, and the land mass, water, whatever, all the resources, uh, you know, the resources is, uh, as we all know, is, uh, is a blessing, but also can be a curse. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Well, we, we, until very recently, we didn't have any resources apart from our brains, and the, uh, and the uh, need uh, for doing things, otherwise we would not be here, so that we use that pretty well. And, um, and, uh, of course, the industry mix uh, in the Russian economy and, uh, and Israeli economy are very, very different. But uh, in terms of economics, differences are actually good for trading because if you're exactly the same, there's not much for you to trade. This is you actually trade with, with, with countries that are different from you. So uh, on, the, on, on the surface, there is a, there's a good uh, potential for trading and, and exchanges. There's a couple of things that are common between the two countries. Both countries were uh, subject to economic experiments. Russia was uh, subject to a more cruel one and for a longer time, but uh, nevertheless with the same origins as Israel, and so we, we came out of it. And the second common part is that we decided there was enough experiments and uh, we all want to go towards a market economy and led market forces to, to determine and to, you know, what is produced and how it is produced, etc. We did it a little earlier because we sort of had our own crisis uh, in the 80s and understood that we couldn't, couldn't go like that anymore. And um, it, was, uh, it was a good decision. Russia uh, came to, to, the, to this uh, a little later and it had to first um, undergo significant political changes that would allow that. But nevertheless, it's advancing very well. Uh, and uh, since, since the establishment of uh, diplomatic relations, we had a very impressive growth in economic relations apart from the strategic interactions that are completely, you know, if you were even in 1985, that would have been completely un, un, inconceivable uh, from what, what is going on. Here, I remember when my cousin came in 88 to Israel. This was for us, we, after 11 years that we haven't seen him and we never thought that we will see him. It was a revelation. I mean, that was just, it was just the beginning. I and mean, today you don't even have to have a visa to, to go between the two countries, which is which is something of, of, of a completely different scale and that actually promoted large tourism. Today, uh, Russian tourists are the second uh, largest tourist population in Israel after U.S. And uh, if things go grow the way as they grow, they're probably going to become uh, first. Uh, the trade grew, the imports, exports, uh, until they grew very rapidly um, in the last decade, about 10% a year in average uh, uh, imports to Israel, about 6% exports. And it, until the, the crisis reduced the world trade everywhere in the world and uh, also put a damp in, in, uh, in the trade between the two countries, but since uh, it started growing again. 
At the same time, uh, we, but by the way, part of this trade and part of the exchanges of businesses and corporations is driven by uh, Russian-speaking Israelis who uh, represent a bridge between the two countries, a very important cultural bridge and as well as uh, important asset on which we can build our future cooperation. Uh, however, with all the development that we observed, um, this is clearly not enough. Uh, Israeli foreign trade to Russia represents about between one and one and a half percent of, of the Israeli total foreign trade. And this is definitely uh, not enough uh, with, for the potential uh, that, that, that exists between Russia and, and Israel. The question is, you know, to grow it significantly requires some fresh thinking, which is uh, something that we would love to do. Uh, together with our uh, with our Russian counterparts, we've initiated um, some talks with the with the economic advisor of uh, the president during my visit, and we hope to uh, reciprocate and to bring him uh, bring him here to to maybe uh, start in fresh some fresh ideas and. and uh, there is some direction, by the way, Prime Minister and the government uh, assign high priority to expanding the uh, economic uh, relations with, the, uh, with Russia because it's a very sound base for, uh, for cooperation in general, and therefore it's, it's part of the general strategy, over, for, it's part of the strategy that, uh, that uh, Minister Ayalon and, and uh, General Gilad were talking about. Uh, there are some directions, and this is to, to finish, um, there's some directions in which we can, we can advance. And we can cooperate in areas where the uh, benefits of cooperation is probably the largest. And I think I can think off the top of my head of, of a few ones. First of all, it's agriculture. Israeli agriculture is, uh, lacks the scale, but has uh, the intensity and the... Um, the research R&D intensity uh, not rivaled anywhere in the world. Uh, so uh, in it, it goes across all the fields from the yields of milk from cows to, to super uh, uh, seeds uh, to various irrigation techniques, everything else. I mean, Russia has scale and potential for drastically increasing the productivity of its agriculture. So this is something clearly uh, mutually beneficial for, to, for both countries to, to cooperate in this area. And uh, there was some talks that were started between the Prime Minister and uh, Premier Putin. Uh, the other area is uh, knowledge industries. Uh, Russia has this initiative of uh, Inograd, uh, the, the initiative to modernize, to bring uh, more high tech uh, into, into the Russian economy. Uh, we know that this is not a, this is not an easy task. Um, Mr. Karganov mentioned that um, that he's skeptical about the the possibility this happens. Um, it's actually a well known fact that when your economy relies on natural resources, uh, you have much less incentives to modernize. Uh, it's uh, you know Israel modernized because of uh, inability not to modernize because otherwise we would be wiped out or not not being able to sustain our economy, uh, and many other countries did the same thing. So um, somehow maybe thinking about this uh, in a more global terms, I don't know how to to generate this, but it's but it's definitely those two things that uh, Russia being the resource-based and rich country and the and the incentive to modernize uh, are, are unfortunately not going in the same direction. Uh, at the same time, you know, efforts m must be made to, to, to do that, and I think uh, Israeli experience, especially using the bridge of uh, Israel, Russian-speaking Israelis, could, could, be, could be useful here, especially in one area which I, I could think I've been, I've been dealing with it in, the, in, the, in my office, is uh, clean tech. Uh, because uh, the future of um, the, f the future of high tech, in some sense, is in 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 the area of environment, of trying to figure out more efficient ways to use energy, trying more efficient ways to use water. Because all these things are going to be in scarce supply. They are already in scarce supply in many countries, and Israel has many many interesting ideas. I'm sure that Russian, Russian scientists do too, but uh, Russia has something that Israel does not have, and this is the ability to scale things up. 
we can't scale things up. We are peanut sized essentially. But uh, in Russia, you can do you can do you can grow big idea to large proportions. And so I think that that is uh, going to be uh, an interesting venue to explore. And I invite our Russian colleagues to to uh, to try to start a dialogue on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last speaker for, for today is uh, um, Dr. Itzhak Brudny, Department of Police, Political Science, Hebrew University. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the advantages of being a last speaker is I can sort of reflect on everybody else said, and the disadvantages, of course, is the last speaker and everybody wants to finish and go home. Uh, so I'm trying to be considerate of a public and audience and not be too long. Uh, again, on, a, uh, on admission, I like Professor Kandel. I am born, was born in the Soviet Union. I came here as a teenager. And after 16 years in 1989, I came to the first time. It was a shock of my life. Uh, and since then, I was ca I'm coming to Russia about twice a year. In the last seven years, I was also teaching in a program which Hebrew University has in the University of Moscow School for Oriental and African Studies, actually teaching about Israel between the superpowers. And this talk is largely based on my lectures and talks uh, to the students uh, of Moscow University. Now, uh, Saying that, I would try to say that if we look at a kind of, in order to look at what is going on now and what it can be, let's look at about the past and about kind of modes of Israeli-Russian relations. And on one hand, you see, on the very positive side, this Mr. Mironov mentioned and others, was the Israeli sort of strategic military alliance of 1948-49, which Israel was uh, fortunate enough at that time having two superpowers, not one, uh, supporting it. Israel always had at least one superpower supporting it. Uh, now, uh, kind of nice uh, thing uh, about that alliance, not, I don't know if anybody knows the figures, but I found them. Uh, Israel uh, at that time, uh, just trying to find the figures, uh, was supplied uh, with uh, 21, 28 Messerschmitt airplanes, which created the Israeli Air Force, um, 50,000 rifles, the famous Czech rifles, which is a learned Israeli politics, uh, which existed in IDF in about more than 30 years, 90 million bullets, etc., etc. So that was the weapons which nobody else was supplying, which was decisive in Israel surviving in uh, 1948-49, and so in that sense, including diplomatic recognition uh, was important. Now, that's one end, strategic military alliance. Uh, at the other end, of course, is 67 to 87, roughly speaking, is Israel versus Soviet Union in a Cold War, when Israel and Russia and Soviet Union was enemies of each other, including military confrontations. Uh, military people here would admit they existed, uh, in, in which Israel sold itself to the United States as a bulwark in the Middle East against the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, of course, was a supporting uh, military and diplomatic supporter of Israeli enemies. So we shouldn't, that's the other end of the relationship. So everything else is in the middle. Uh, one of them is, of course, the so I call it the cold peace or cold friendship, roughly between the mid-50s uh, to 1967, about 10 years where there were diplomatic relationship, some cultural relationship, some trade, the famous visit of Spartak Moscow soccer team here in Israel in 1966, which apparently was a big event in Israel. I wasn't there at that time, but maybe people who are older can remind us. There were some trade missions, uh, and etc. Now, what we do, with relationship as they are now, where they stand, uh, where the limitations. And in order to understand this relationship, uh, we have to understand, in my opinion, uh, two major things. One of them is what is Russian national interest as they defined, especially since the mid-90s. And here, 
uh, Dr. Karagana was sitting, who was very important since the mid-90s, or defining and articulating Russian national interests, especially in the foreign policy. Now, and that interest can be defined in short, uh, sort of uh, supporting the creation of multipolar world, creating a balanced against the superdominance of the United States as the superpower. And every Russian foreign policy, in my opinion, people may argue with me, is a derivative of a Russian national interest. So, and especially the interest, the relationship between United States and Russia. Now, that is one. If we're going to the other end of where Israel stands here, and we should not, uh, we have the so-called special relations. You know, this is our way of saying, and I'm here, I'm not in a government and never been, so I can speak openly. We have a client state of the United States. If, we, if as a scholars we define what is a client state, well, a client state which should not always behave as a client state, and some anti-Israeli scholars find it here as a conspiracy, why we're not behaving as a client state supposed to behave. But we received since our existence, since Israel uh, was established, about 90 billion in US assistance since 1949. And we receive about, uh, I think people in the government can correct me, about $3 billion, three, uh, billion dollars, uh, a year since uh, signing uh, of aid, since signing of uh, first Ken David Accords. Uh, so we have, we're dependent, we're dependent f uh, on the United States on the military level, we depend on the United States is more important for political level or in, in multilateral organization and vetoes in the United Nations. And if this is our ally, this is our basically patron, and in, in entire history of Zionism, it was, it's always virtue, was a, is Zionist movements was always supported by one superpower. And I guess I said 48, 49, we were supported by two. Now, what it means? And if it means that we're going to have a friction with Russia, and uh, Major General Gilad mentioned them, uh, because in this relationship, uh, Russia has its own. Russia, would Russia doesn't, for example, view Hamas uh, as a terrorist organization and would have relationships. Russia would sell weapons to Syria because it serves some of Russian natural, natural, national interests we may not understand. And that something, uh, that, and at the same time, we can have tourism, no visa agreement, uh, strategic cooperation. I don't think, by the way, that that should exaggerate it. Israel doesn't have no visa agreement with the United States. Uh, and doesn't mean anything about our uh, relationship. Uh, so we have to understand that. So we're going to have a limits. Now, on the other side, you know, sometimes Israel and Russia would not see eye to eye foreign policy. You know, Israel was a major supporter of the United States in the Second Gulf War. We were major cheerleaders when Russia was absolutely on the other side of the barricade, on, uh, on politically on that side. We, Russia was against uh, President Bush's uh, second, uh, second uh, invasion of Iraq. Uh, and we, for our strategic reasons, uh, supported it. So that kind of thing should not be overlooked. They may continue and may not. Uh, now, uh, that's something to say about uh, limits of, so we have to be aware that our relationship would have kind of what's I call institutional structural limits where national interests are not always coincide. They coincide on terror, and that's we heard it throughout of the day. Terror, 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 yes, and on this area, I'm not sure that this is area are, are so crucial to Israel national survival as a nation. You know, weapons to Syria, uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Iran, the, uh, which is, Russia moving uh, toward a different position as a result of uh, relaunching of relationship between the United States and Russia. So every time the relationship between Russia and the United States are getting better, uh, derivative of that, uh, we're going to benefit uh, one way or another. Now, uh, on a different uh, area, uh, something was said about uh, <coughs> economics, and I would give some figures which uh, Professor Condell gave, but it's more, you know, it is a trade, in, a, in a economic trade which is going on, uh, but again, I just downloaded the data today about Israeli trade relations, it's, and I look for 2008, which is the last pre-crisis data. You know, Israeli, Russian-Israeli trade, the entire trade of Israel is 1.44%, 1.4%, so it's negligible. In comparison, 
Israel trade with Europe is about 32%. Israel trade with the United States is 22%. With India, it's 32 With China, 44 So Russia is uh, relatively little. And here, of course, uh, things could improve. Uh, one of the examples of this trade is very interesting. I was in Moscow a couple of years ago, went to the Dutch of my friends, went to the supermarket, and found Israeli potatoes. With still Hebrew labels on it, and I found that is interesting that uh, coal, uh, the very hot country of Israel in, ex exports to very cold country of Russia potatoes. Uh, well, everything can happen. Uh, but uh, here it is. You know, the interesting thing, uh, Mironov was speaking about high tech cooperation, but high tech cooperation includes modernization, it includes modernization of Russian economy. Prefer Dr. Karaganov said, you know, this is more talk. Than, uh, than reality, uh, resource costs, which Professor Kandel mentioned, is a problem. Now, I talked to several Russian Israeli high tech people, and they said, well, you know, we don't see this thing. We, our natural, uh, we get our programmers from India, and we trade with the Silicon Valley. That's the natural thing where we're going. So this is a problem here. So uh, the most important thing Israel has, which is a high tech, I think Russian economy is not ready yet. Uh, to cooperate. It's not clear when it will. Now, on, uh, on a different issue, on people's-to-people's um, -people's diplomacy, it was only mentioned uh, tourism, uh, 70 flights, which um, Lieberman was mentioning, 70 flights a week. But I think there are limits there as well. I think it's good. It's good that there's no, uh, that all, each of us can you know, buy a ticket and fly to Moscow tomorrow, uh, and it only should be encouraged. But there are limits here, and very interesting ones. Uh, I was always curious why Israeli diaspora in Israel doesn't behave the way Jewish diaspora in the United States behaves toward Israel. So, in other words, why Israeli diaspora, Russian-speaking diaspora here, uh, it's Russian-speaking rather than Russian because only about 26% are from Russian Federation. Uh, the rest were from Ukraine, actually, is the biggest uh, component. Why they're not pushing for a better relationship? You know, this is natural. Uh, we see how American Jews behave. Why is uh, Russian Jews would not behave better? And it's interesting if you, there's no, A, they're not organized the way uh, American Jews are organized. And we're absolutely, we're not as interested in acting as American Jews in pushing toward the Israeli, uh, improvement of Israeli-Russian uh, relations. Uh, even Israeli political parties, you know, I would expect a party of Mr. Lieberman uh, to be much more. And they did one thing, uh, the abolition of a trade, uh, of a visa agreement, which was done. But, you know, in comparison to, you think, this is a party which represents the two-thirds of its voters come from the so-called Russian sector in Israel. You would see more, or pushing more, but it's, uh, again, in comparison internationally, if you look away, American Jewish community acts, this is very little. Now, uh, if, you, if I go uh, more, relatively very little, you know, if you look at the United States, uh, Israel has the United States, a famous Fulbright Agreement in which American scholars can come here and Israeli scholars come to the United <coughs> States. There's nothing like that. You know, nothing like that exists between Israel uh, and Russian universities. Uh, there's not, nothing of, of I'm aware of which exist on that kind of level, so it's very little. I have graduate students who are working on Russian topics. We have no money to send them to Russia. That's, an, uh, that's, an, uh, that's uh, reality of life. Now, uh, the Russian-speaking youth, and there is a lot of them, uh, you know, when I ask them what's your favorite places to go, we have a free time, Moscow would not, or St. Petersburg would not be on the top three. Paris, New York, London, Prague, the usual destinations of Russian-speaking Israeli, Israeli youth. So Russia is not for them as kind of an attractive place to visit, despite the fact that they speak the language, despite the fact that they have cultural ties, and so on and so forth. So there are limits to that. It doesn't mean that uh, things are doomed or forever, but one has to think outside the box and how things to improve. Yes, there is this thing, and one cannot deny 20%. Uh, probably more of uh, Israeli citizens came from what used to be a so uh, former Soviet Union. And that is a fact, and the relationship could have been better I don't, if one can think outside the box. And here I think uh, I probably stop. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. You know, Dr. Brodny, you mentioned uh, potatoes, potatoes from Israel. You know, two weeks ago, the embassy, they, we have a letter and they ask us to deliver 3,000 ton of potatoes from Israel to Russia. Uh, it's uh, a pity, but uh, there wasn't so many potatoes <laughs> in Israel for Russia, maybe next year. Okay, mm, I want to thank everything, uh, everyone, and I want to thank uh, Evgenia Bovin for coming here. Uh, have a good time here in our Holy Land. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to Israel. Thank you.